Hello everyone and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Domain Password Auditing with the Cloud. Today's featured speaker is Matthew Toussaint. If during the webcast you have any questions for our speaker, please enter them into the chat window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Your feedback is very important to us and I'll be putting an evaluation link in the chat window for you to complete. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides of the recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Matthew. Hello, everyone. I hope you're staying safe and I hope you're going to have a good time on our webcast uh, that we're kicking off right now. So if you're curious, this webcast, its motivation came actually from the SANS SEC 460 class. It's one of the newest classes that we have in SANS, and it's actually our newest course to have a GX certification, the GEVA. That said, the certification, while new, this content is actually not directly from the course, at least not yet. This is actually a sneak preview into some of the new material that we're adding to the course here shortly. There's, in fact, uh, slated for July, a really, really large update that we've got planned. The world, of course, moves on, particularly in information security and at a very quick and rapid rate. And so we want to, of course, make the course and all SANS content that we deliver as poignant and applicable on the day-to-day -day as is possible. So for this big major update, we're actually in fact even adjusting the name of the course slightly to include much of the infrastructure and cloud that organizations and enterprises have to deal with, both to assess from a vulnerability perspective, to maintain, as well as to leverage for the purpose of performing these assessments in a more robust manner and fashion. So where the first thing to consider is vulnerability assessment. What is an assessor and what is the objective that we're seeking to accomplish here? Vulnerability assessment is not an inferior service to penetration testing. It's also not a preliminary service before penetration testing. Vulnerability assessment is simply completely different from penetration testing. Generally speaking, most organizations can benefit a lot more from a vulnerability assessment than a penetration test. Because with the penetration test, we're looking to dive deep, whereas with a vulnerability assessment, we're looking for scale, a vulnerability assessment and management programs required for the organization to get a handle on what their vulnerabilities actually are, and then to be able to take action and begin remediation components too. With a penetration test, that's not the case. Penetration testing is focused on telling a story. For example, I had a client a few years back during, uh, well, when Game of Thrones was really big, this client was not HBO. Um, so refer to them as not HBO. And so they asked us for a penetration test. And they said, hey, we've got all of our sensitive information, this $1 billion IP that we're working on. We've got it in an offline vault. So you won't find it. Good luck anyways, though. Well, so we did a penetration test. And of course, we found the movie and we watched the movie and it was decent. What they needed in this case was a penetration test. And the reason they needed a penetration test was because they had made an assessment of their risk. They assessed that their risk was low because they were storing their sensitive information in an offline air-gapped vault. This, of course, was not true. We ended up compromising a, uh, a track management system that the director was using to take individual clips of the actual movie and using that to evaluate uh, the components of it. So if you have all the clips and you put them together, what do you have? You've got the movie. And so the reason they needed a penetration test is because they needed somebody to tell them this story, the story of what their actual risk is, to prove that their assessment was valid or invalid. In this case, it was, it was invalid. In the case where your assessments are potentially accurate, or when you are trying to get a hold of the vulnerabilities and look towards remediation, that vulnerability assessment must be there. In their case, they probably could have gotten that same idea, gotten the same vulnerabilities that we used to prove that their risk existed via penetration test if they had just done a vulnerability assessment. For example, we leveraged the exploit that's commonly known as Eternal Blue. This would have been one of the most criticals that should pop off of any vulnerability assessment form for any enterprise ever. We also were able to get into a password vault 
using credentials that had been reused. And this is really where vulnerability assessment, particularly around an enterprise, really picks up steam. Vulnerability assessment and penetration testing, they both have value propositions. And we tend to think of penetration testing as being more elite or more difficult. And to a very small extent, that might be true. But let's take a look today, and we'll culminate with a lab at the very end of this presentation to see if that's actually true. Because vulnerability assessment, in my opinion, can also be quite a complex and advanced service to provide with a very different value proposition. So first, if we're going to perform vulnerability assessment, we want to start with some kind of framework in order to then progress through and make sure that we haven't left anything behind, that we haven't missed anything. In SEC 460, we've got the vulnerability assessment framework that we follow, all the way from planning down into reporting with all of the other concerns for vulnerability assessment in the middle. Things like threat modeling, which is a, uh, a service that's very commonly left out of vulnerability assessment. Many folks tend to think that that's not part of VA, but they'd be wrong. And we can tell when we look at things like re remediation. What information do we need to build that culminating site picture? We need to find vulnerabilities. So yes, vulnerability scanning. But with that vulnerability scanning, we can't simply live off of CVSS scores. For example, Heartbleed has a CVSS of 5.0 but that tells us nothing about what the actual risk is to the environment, to the organization, or the enterprise. So we need to go a lot deeper. And when we talk about risk, we often think about it as risk equals uh, the likelihood of something being exploited times the impact of that exploitation. But if we think about likelihood, how can you know likelihood without getting an adequate representation of your threat model? And so this is a requirement for vulnerability assessment if we're going to be able to pre present accurate findings. Then, of course, we need to find the things we want to look for vulnerabilities on and then scan them. But we also need to think about a different style of information, and that's confidence. How confident are we that our finding is correct or invalid? Validation is often another piece that's very often skipped in vulnerability assessment programs. And the reason is, well, we're busy. And if we found and are tracking 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 vulnerabilities, wouldn't it be better to know more about the vulnerabilities that are there? Or would it be better to know which ones are more likely to be valid? But we often skip this calculus that we need to do because we have finite discovery resources with vulnerability assessment. That's true. But we also have finite remediation resources with vulnerability assessment. Validation allows us to take the best of both worlds, to put enough validation and increase our confidence such that our remediation time and effort isn't wasted, but also to allow us to still have the time to do discovery across enterprise scale. Finally, remediation. Generally speaking, the vulnerability assessment crew isn't performing remediation themselves. However, we are, in fact, the information security experts around this uh, topic. And so if we take it to, say, a system owner, somebody who owns that application or piece of software who has to then patch it, well, they may follow direct patching guidelines. But what about a compensating control? For example, if we still talk about Eternal Blue there, Eternal Blue is an exploit that triggers against SMB version 1. So we could patch that vulnerability, and you should. Or if we disabled SMB v1, the vulnerability would no longer be effective. That's an alternative way to patch a problem. And sometimes it might actually be the better way to patch a problem. For example, what if you've got a device that is a virtual machine, and it's been snapshotted? Then a vulnerability comes across and there's this big effort to patch all the systems. It gets patched. What if it then gets reverted to snapshot? Is it still patched? Whereas if you've got some kind of group policy that implements the, uh, uh, the compensating control, the moment it connects back to the environment, the uh, group policy update triggers and your problem is still solved. So alternative mechanisms of patching are really important to consider as well. Excuse me for one moment. When we start thinking about these vulnerabilities across a domain, though, Active Directory is a key component for us to consider as well. The integrations here with our Windows domains are really, really important because our enterprise tends to live off of this ADDS, Active Directory Domain Services, backbone. With Active Directory, we have to think about it as a common foundation for the entire network. 
What we mean by that is, think about your local system's Windows registry. That Windows registry is essentially a database of all the Windows configuration settings for that system. In Active Directory, we have a shared database that goes across all systems. This is what we call a Windows domain, and it's controlled by a domain controller, or potentially multiple domain controllers. In fact, Active Directory can even become more complex than this, particularly when we're dealing with large enterprises who maybe have had to go through things like M&As. So with Active Directory, we really need to spend some time focusing here. And the reason for it is most enterprises, the vast, vast majority of all enterprises, live and breathe on this shared administrative infrastructure that is Active Directory. Sometimes you even see Unix systems with LDAP connectors communicating across this infrastructure. Attackers know this and attackers leverage these trust relationships in order to gain access to systems and move laterally between them. They're generally here operating without actually triggering vulnerabilities. These aren't things where the vendor has a patch. There's no patch for a password. But we have to model what the threat actors are actually doing in order to determine what the risk of their actions can be to our enterprises. It comes down to it, not all vulnerabilities have CVSS scores. In fact, the biggest vulnerability in all enterprises today is password one. Yes, the most common password in use today is password one with a capital P. Why? Active Directory, it's entirely based around Active Directory. In Active Directory, the default password policy for Windows 2008 or newer functional level domains is for the default password policy to be eight characters long with complexity. Complexity works like this, uppercase, lowercase, number, and symbols. Pick three of those. In the case of password one, you've got your uppercase, you've got your lowercase, and you've got your number. This is a really big problem. This is a terrible problem for our enterprises. Our password policies make it even worse. We have things like history that require you to have a unique password for the last 10 passwords that you've used. How do users remember this? They come up with cheats, things like winter 20 for winter 2020. We also have default credentials, things like Cisco and Cisco for Cisco systems. These are the big components of our enterprises that are really, really vulnerable. When it comes to things like infrastructure appliances like Cisco devices, I find these on almost every single, single major vulnerability assessment or penetration test that I perform almost every single one of them. Password one, I generally see it hundreds of times for every domain. And so if we're focused on more, uh, say, unique vulnerabilities like Spectre and Meltdown because they have logos, we might be missing the point. And the point is that Active Directory really matters. Active Directory is organized into all kinds of little groups and objects, things like organizational units. We often refer to these as OUs. Group policy are the things that are policies, so settings that we're able to configure against these. For example, the password policy is a group policy for the Active Directory domain. You can have different password policies against different domains, even under, say, a shared forest that is multiple domains with transitive trust relationships. And so these roles that they have are how we control them. For example, with domain controllers, you may have one or you may have multiple domain controllers. Most enterprises generally have more than one domain controller for the perspective of um, uh, the robustness, if you will, of the domain itself. For example, the domain controller is where a user who logs in types their password actually authenticates into. So if the domain controller goes down, users may not be able to log on to the domain and get access to systems. As a result of that, we often have more than one domain controller, but now you have two systems that share a database that needs to be synchronized. So you'll see things like DC sync, which is an API call that domain controllers make to each other in order to replicate data between their multi-master uh, multi database. We also see attack tools leverage these same kind of things. Many organizations tend to think that an attacker can only steal all their passwords if they get domain admin access and get access to the domain controller itself. But an attacker could use a tool like Mimikatz in order to perform a DC sync call across the network in order to retrieve those passwords without ever actually gaining access to the domain controller itself directly. This is really, really common. We see this also in a lot of attack tools such as PowerShell Empire. 
Kerberos is actually how we perform this authentication in order to get valid access to these things. It's named after Cerberus, and that's apt because it actually has three different phases. The client and server, and these are the two things that are trying to communicate back and forth with each other in a secure manner, but also a key distribution center. That KDC is what's going to broker this exchange in order to make sure that the parties, client and server, can perform this communication without additional risk. There are good ways to do this, and there are bad ways to do this. With Windows, we have a fair number of these protocols, things like Landman Challenge Response which is based on the LM or Landman hash. Uh, authentication exchanges like NTLM v1 and NTLM v2. And as you go up in complexity, they become more and more difficult to actually crack. In the case of Kerberos, Kerberos tickets are very uh, relatively computationally intense, which means that it takes a decent amount of resource to crack these. So when we start talking about gaining access to passwords, we start talking about what the difficulty is in it, when we're doing password guessing, and the password is password one, it's very simple. If we're doing password guessing, we don't actually need access to the actual protocol data or the hashes themselves, which means the attacker doesn't need access to anything except the ability to communicate, so the network itself. Let's say you're using email. If you're using email, well, O365 is a way to do this communication. An internal Active Directory environment's Kerberos really drives a lot of this, or it should. So with domain controllers, we have multiple of these. The actual domain controller database where all this information is stored is in the ntds.dit archive. This archive can be quite large, but it is actually specific to the domain itself. So if we have more than one domain, let's say that our organization has gone through a mergers and acquisition of another company, let's say we're Priceline, and we are uh, acquiring all other sales firms like Expedia whenever possible. Well, when we acquire these resources, most enterprises, for the perspective of um, saving resources and conservation there, they'll join those IT departments together, and they'll have them manage this information that way. How do they do that? How do you share those relationships? In Active Directory, you do this via a forest. So the original domain, say, uh, Expedia.com and Priceline.com, they both still exist, but they're managed by different domain controllers. They share, however, a forest between them. This is an example of how a Kerberos authentication exchange works, where you authenticate to the key KDC, that's the key distribution center, directly, and you ask for a ticket-granting ticket. If that authentication is successful, you get a ticket-granting ticket. Cool. It's encrypted by the Kerberos tickets account. The thing is, this doesn't actually tell us anything about what resources you're allowed to have. It just says you have a valid relationship with the Active Directory environment. Next, we send the ticket-granting ticket to the KDC to ask for a service ticket. That service ticket is then encrypted with the hash of the target account. And then we use that TGS in order to ask the server for access to that service. When we start thinking about vulnerability space in Kerberos, this is really, really important to know because each one of these three components has its own attack surface. And we see those kind of things with attacks like golden ticket attacks and silver ticket attacks or Kerberosting, which all take apart of this authentication exchange and attack it directly. But let's talk about actual vulnerabilities as opposed to protocol nuances like those other ticket attacks. For example, MS14068. This is, in my opinion, the worst vulnerability to have ever affected Windows environments, period. And it doesn't really get a lot of coverage. This in, uh, vulnerability is also interesting insofar as it's the only privilege escalation vulnerability that Microsoft has ever rated critical in the history of the company. That's interesting. And the reason for that is that MS14068 is a privilege escalation vulnerability across the domain itself. It allows you to go from any domain user, real domain user, but any domain user with a valid TGT to become any other domain user where your new TGT as that other domain user is still valid. So how does that work? It works like this. The way that a ticket, a Kerberos ticket, can identify what you should have access to is based off of the privilege attribute certification. This tells what security groups a user's in, things like domain administrators. It's signed by the KDC, but if that KDC is vulnerable to MS14068, 
it may accept insecure algorithms like CRC32. This allows us to modify our legitimate TGT, so it's privilege escalation here, modify our legitimate TGT to become any other domain user, including the domain administrator. Really very dangerous. But to understand the risk, we have to realize that an attacker must gain access to the environment first in order to be able to use something like this. So when performing our actual assessment of risk, we need to understand the technical details of many of those vulnerability conditions that we're looking towards. In the case of this one, it's very, very easy to get a fish. Most compromises start that way. This vulnerability allows an attacker to get access at the domain administrator level within five minutes after getting a click on a phishing link. This is really dangerous. But it tells us all about what matters, and that thing is access. And passwords are the authentication boundaries that allow us to control these kinds of access. Passwords control everything today. We are seeing some kind of move, where possible, to alternative authentication mechanisms, things like two-factor authentication. This is nice, but it's not always as obvious as we think. For example, two-factor authentication in Microsoft Windows Active Directory. We just saw the Kerberos authentication exchange there. If we were to add two-factor authentication, what would that look like? Can any of these components contain a second factor? And the answer is no. There are a fair number of authentication systems that say that they are adding two-factor authentication to Windows authentication, but that's not accurate. It's simply incorrect. Because if you look at network authentication here in Active Directory, it's Kerberos. Where in this Kerberos diagram is two-factor authentication? It doesn't exist, and it's not a thing. So when we evaluate the strength of our authentication systems and mechanisms, we have to understand them in order to determine what snake oil is and what a legitimate compensating control might be for a vulnerability that we've assessed as part of our vulnerability assessment process. Legitimate things for two-factor authentication might be something like a authenticator for Office 365, which leverages something else, right? So we're talking two-factor, we're talking about what you know, what you have, and potentially what you are. With biometrics, what you are often gets boiled back down into what you have. For example, with Kerberos, it starts with the NTLM hash, right? So if you know the NTLM hash, you know the password, well, does it matter that you were using a common access card or that you were using um, uh, a YubiKey? In the end, it translates to a hash that's then used for Kerberos. So we'll pass the ticket attack, we've got access to the ticket and can replay it in some fashion, will still be effective and bypass that two-factor authentication control because it's not really there. But if we look at two-factor authentication against a lot of mobile or web applications, oftentimes these are out of band where you have that actual physical device and you know the password to gain access to a system. This changes the game as far as authentication strength and communication inside these environments. This brings into bear a condition that we call ACE, or Authenticated Code Execution by Design. Because we also have to realize, okay, passwords are important, but what do they actually get you? We're often worried about full compromise or access to a system or device. Does a password get you that? What if it's a password to a web application? Does that result in that? And the thing is, most developers have implemented features in their systems that we call extensibility. And the reason for this is when they're trying to sale, right, they give it to their salespeople, the salespeople say, hey, what's your requirement specification? Okay, this is a list of things that this product must be able to do. They take that requirement specification and they paste it into the features of their actual application. How can they get away with that? Extensibility. Well, this doesn't include that feature directly, but it can be extended to include that via the plugin editor. This is really, really common. And what that means is, if you can authenticate, then you can use the plugin editor. And if that plugin editor allows you to extend to accomplish anything, that's full access to a system. And some of these systems weren't necessarily intended by the users to get access at all. For example, what we see here is an Avacent KVM. It stands for Keyboard, Video, and Mouse. This appliance is something I saw while doing a vulnerability assessment for a digital forensics firm. This digital forensics firm had this appliance on their environment, and they just plugged it in, didn't really realize what it did beyond being a rack-mounted KVM to allow them to switch their keyboard between different servers on the rack. Okay. 
So we found this. We found this by doing a quick scan and identifying HTTPS self-signed certificates. Not really a vulnerability at all. Nessus was able to find those, but Nessus doesn't qualify those as a vulnerability because it's very common to see that. In fact, it's standard to see that in infrastructure appliances like an absent KVM. But the question then is, what is the purpose of that system? And is that purpose dangerous? So we browsed to it with a web browser. And the web browser said, hey, uh, would you like to install this Java applet? So of course, we clicked, yes, I would love to install that Java applet. And we did. And when it refreshed the page, it gave us a user and password prompt. So we go, what's the default password for an Avacent KVM? Avacent, Avacent. Probably should have guessed that, but you know, okay. So we logged on and we were presented with a screen that you see here on the slide. But instead of virtual machine A, the virtual machines were named, things like DC1, DC2, Exchange. We clicked on the domain controller, it was logged in, we had full domain access with nothing but a default credential on a device that they didn't even realize was networked. It simply happened to have an ethernet port, so they figured they were supposed to plug that in. And they did. Default credentials are extremely dangerous. Access authentication is often analogous to exploitability. You don't need a zero-day exploit, and attackers very rarely use zero-day exploits or even exploits at all. Why use those when you can simply log in to the system? We need to consider these, and we need to discover these default credentials throughout our environment. Nessus was unable to identify that Avacent was using a default password. Couple reasons. Nessus doesn't know how to install a Java applet. And even if it did, it wouldn't know that it was an Avacent appliance and to try a spe specified list of default passwords for that appliance itself. A lot of this is things that we are going to need to identify and discover ourselves when performing vulnerability assessment against our enterprise. So what other kind of password weaknesses do we commonly see? We can guessable, yes, absolutely. Again, the most common password is password one, okay? We see passwords that are based on usernames, uh, passwords that are based on color. In, uh, in English, green tends to be a really common color being used. Why? Um, I think it has to do with green being uh, commonly referred to for money as well, but I would know, I just see it in passwords all the time. How do we identify if there are these trends in our environment? For a lot of enterprises, you'll see something like this. The top three passwords are, of course, your most common standard ones, and the next four are somewhat unique to the enterprise itself. But you have a thousand of them across all your users. The first one that normally ends up being number two in the most common password is something like Team Reset, or Welcome123, or Change Me. Company name exclamation mark. Uh, the Air Force, the US Air Force Academy's default password for all systems is Go Falcons, capital G, capital F, exclamation mark. That's the default administrator password for all of the systems on that network. It's not a common password, but it is common to that enterprise. And so how do we discover these? We have to crack for them. Because otherwise, we'll never be able to identify those. What are some other kind of things that we see with passwords often? Uh, company names followed by expletives, pretty common. Uh, keyboard patterns, so you might have 1QAZ, shift 1QAZ across the keyboard. This one's a really interesting style of password selection. The reason it's interesting is because it's a trick, but it's an IT trick, which means while it might not be the most common password, it does have a tendency towards IT or system administrator use. So keyboard patterns are often not just used, but they often turn into more access than other common passwords. And this begs our next question. Are all users created equal? And while HR may say yes, from the perspective of information security, no, not all users are created equal at all. Attackers wanna go after your CEO. Attackers wanna go after your system administrators. Attackers wanna go after your uh, system owners for certain applications that have a lot of value and store a lot of sensitive information. They're looking for this information. In that not HBO pen test, that's exactly what we did. We targeted, we targeted users that were using that track management system. Once we found a credential, we replayed it against the track management system and were able to gain access to a billion dollar intellectual property. We need to consider these things when we start to evaluate and analyze our actual domain passwords. Reuse is really one of the most important things here. 
Because while we might be looking at passwords in one system, say Active Directory, people are gonna reuse those passwords for things like email, internal applications, SharePoint, et cetera. We also end up with a password selection vulnerability here, one that's a bit difficult to identify. For example, this XKCD you see on the right is very, very common. And it's often sent around by IT people who are doing information awareness training. Hey, look, use a password like this or pick passwords in this way. Pick four large words and put them together and there's your password. It's much stronger than something that's complex and hard to remember, okay? I have cracked a number of passwords that were correct horse battery staple, exactly that. And the reason for that is users saw this information awareness training and they said, oh, that's what I'm supposed to use for my password? So they used it for their password. And they might be, oh, gee whiz, layer eight. Ah, oh, users are always the death of us. But if we think about it, we've seen this before. Why is password one the most common password? It's because we told users to use a password and they took us literally. So the password selection vulnerability here is actually a vulnerability in our information awareness process. But the only way to find those is to test our passwords. Because if we don't, how could we possibly know? What about that complexity though? What is the real value of complexity? These tend to be the settings that we see in a lot of password policies, and they tend to be really, really bad for us. Password complexity, in fact, and password age specifically, is no longer even recommended by NIST. Why? Because it causes our users to choose worse passwords. The reason why we have passwords like Winter 20 right now is because of password age requirements. Users forget the password, and they reset it to something that's easier to remember. In fact, we call this downward password drift. This means that when a user changes their password, it becomes weaker than the password that they had before. Let's say that you, uh, you forgot your password to log into something, and you have to go through a whole password reset process, especially that password reset process is really complex and painful, like DigitalOcean's, okay? Are you going to pick a harder to remember password so that you have to go through it again even sooner in the future, or are you gonna pick an easier to remember password, like password? And so what, what it turns out is that the more restrictive our password policies are for users and the harder it is for users to remember their passwords as a result of them, the more likely it is for our users to come up with cheats like Winter 20 or keyboard patterns in order to get around our password policy and our networks become less secure as a result of that. Complexity, does that really make any difference that's worth it? Well, let's just do the math. If you have a key, a password that is one character and it's all lowercase, A through Z, that is one in 26 chance of guessing it, okay? If we double the complexity, right, lowercase and uppercase, that gives us 52 possibilities. What if we made it all lowercase but two characters? That's not 52, that's 26 squared. 26 times 26 is a lot more than 52. When it comes down to it, look at the raw math, Complexity is simply irrelevant for our passwords. However, it makes our users pick weaker and weaker passwords. Windows NT hashes are not particularly strong, but if we look at the math on brute force cracking them, an eight character password, which is the default for most uh, Active Directory domains in the world today, less than seven characters. Doesn't matter how good the password is. If it's nine characters, that's one character extra. Seven and a half hours. Is one character extra easier to remember than all kinds of weird complexity? Absolutely it is. But that doesn't mean it's easier for computers. Computers don't think like we do. And we can take advantage of that for our user's sake. When we up it to 10 characters, it's 17 days, we're starting to get really strong passwords. We tend to recommend that you use a 15 character password. I tend to recommend personally that you use a 15 character password with zero complexity. Now that said, I do tend to adjust my recommendation here as well for another reason. Password synchronization. Users are gonna reuse their passwords, but the places they reuse their passwords may require complexity. And it's very frustrating for users to have a password that's strong because it's long in one place and to have that strong password rejected somewhere else because it's not complex and therefore must be weak. We did the math, that's simply inaccurate. But it still means that users have to remember when to use complexity and when not to use complexity. 
So I tend to recommend that all users use complexity and that the complexity they use be the same every single time. Start all of your passwords with one capital A exclamation mark and then lowercase for the rest. Why? Because complexity is irrelevant. It doesn't make your password stronger, but it makes it harder to remember. The harder it is to remember, the more likely it is you're going to reset it. The more likely you are to reset it, the more likely it is your password is weaker. They're cause and effect relationships that we need to be aware of when we start performing these recommendations to, uh, to our clients and our organizations. So what about that threat model? Let's model it here real quickly. With password attacks, we tend to split these into two categories, online attacks and offline attacks. With an online attack, we've got some kind of authentication interface that we can try to log into, and it'll either accept or reject our credential. Like email, we try to log on to O365, and it tells us, yes, your password good, no, your password is bought, was bad. These online password attacks are what we call guess and check attacks. You try to log in, and it says, nope, your password was bad, or it says, yes, your password was good. Online attacks tend to be limited by the speed in which it's possible to perform them. With an online attack, you're limited by your bandwidth. You're limited by how fast the application is going to accept those connections. If it accepts if it accepts a lot, okay, maybe you have a thousand per second. Maybe it's not really going very fast, or maybe there's a rate limiter on the actual application. It presents the user with a captcha or something of the sort. Well, then you might be limited. It might be a hundred or two hundred attempts that you can guess per second. If we're talking about online versus offline password attacks. With offline password cracking, we're often on the order of hundreds of billions or even trillions of password guesses per second. When we compare that to an online password attack, where we're talking maybe 1,000, maybe 10,000 if you know the stars align, the risk of successful password attacks here is much, much lower. So if we talk about which users matter, which users are more important, and which interfaces an attacker may launch an attack against, we have to realize that the risk for an online password attack tends to be a lot lower. So perhaps for an online password attack, eight character passwords are okay. But in an offline sense, that would never fly. In either case though, passwords that are commonly used or in a dictionary, like password one or one, two, three, ABC, will always fall out here. Dictionary vulnerabilities are really important to identify when we've got a password online attack potential. Spraying versus guessing tends to be a choice made by the attacker depending on the circumstances in which they launch the attack. In the case of, say, an Active Directory domain, by default in Microsoft Windows, three incorrect attempts at logging in will cause the user account to lock out. The way that password spraying works instead of password guessing is that you guess one password against all users. In major enterprises, you might have thousands and thousands of users. For example, we in fact have an enterprise for you right here. or a demo fail perhaps instead. And so in Windows Active Directory, it's actually quite simple to discover the users that are there. Any domain user can run this command net user slash domain. And this will give you all of the users in the actual Active Directory domain, which we can see here. There's no permissions that are required in order to perform something like this. It's a feature of Active Directory. And so if a user, an attacker, is able to gain access because a user clicked on a link, what we need to infer from that is they know all of the usernames. And we saw on that domain controller, there were hundreds or thousands of them. We're talking about a major enterprise. We might be seeing tens of thousands of user credentials. That means tens of thousands of guesses per observation window. This is the next thing that's really important about our password policy. We have our lockout policy, yes, but the observation window is how long those incorrect attempts are observed for. 
In Windows Active Directory, the default observation window is 15 minutes. So you're guessing correctly once, guessing correctly twice, wait 15 minutes and you can guess twice again. This means if you have 10,000 users, that's 20,000 password attempts per 15 minutes. Run that overnight, we're talking about a decently uh, fast, decently capable online password attack against the Active Directory domain. But again, as with password guessing, password spraying is also limited to passwords that are fairly common in nature because you don't have the ability to go in the millions and billions of guesses and attempts per second. What kind of applications might we see here? Things like OWA, Outlook. In this case, we might use something like MailSniper, which is an upcoming lab for Sec460's day three, not the one we're gonna demo today, but another lab that's coming up. MailSniper allows us to do things like auditing Windows Active Directory in the cloud, which we all technically have today. There's on-prem Active Directory and there's Azure AD, this is true, but there's an interface between all of those. Even if you're using on-prem Exchange today, it is almost certainly interfacing through Office 365. This means that we can perform these external to the actual enterprise in almost all cases. MailSniper is an outstanding tool to be able to do things like that, and password spraying attacks are a feature that, it's, uh, that it has in its ballywick. MailSniper is written by Bo Bullock, and it's all in PowerShell. PowerShell is a real big focus for us when we're doing enterprise vulnerability assessments since it's ubiquitous to the environment. And because we have such a great need for scale, well, PowerShell allows us to scale very, very quickly and easily. We can also use it to gather information about the domain, see what kind of data is exposed, and even evaluate certain controls in Active Directory. And so we have to realize that some of these systems are ubiquitous. Email is the backbone of enterprises today. Basically, every enterprise has email. Basically, all email is exposed via Microsoft. This means today you are vulnerable to password guessing and password spraying attacks. It's not an exception to the rule. You're vulnerable. And so what are we doing to identify what the actual risk is to these situations? And MailSniper is a tool that lets us do that. Um, we can also use things like uh, CredSniper to do things against um, a two-factor authentication, because while two-factor authentication is outstanding, there are ways around it too, and we need to understand those. With some of these tools, we can even attack external systems to the enterprise via these interfaces in the cloud. Because this cloud connection from our enterprise direct to Microsoft, big Microsoft, it's a big deal. In this case, we see it with Gmail. Um, there's, of course, G Suite for Business and uh, OWA, EWS, that's Exchange Web Services, Outlook Web Access, on the Microsoft side. These two have almost the entire spectrum of email and calendar suites on the internet today. Uh, in this case, we see calendar invent event injection attacks against the Google Calendar. This here uh, is triggered with the smallest event that's possible for um, uh, Google, which is a 10 minute event. You can schedule three of those per 10 minute interval. This is spammed across ad infinitum. And since these aren't series, the only way to get rid of those is to delete each event individually. I live by my Google Calendar. If your enterprise does, this is what we call a denial of service attack in the extreme. So what about defenses? Two-factor authentication is extremely, extremely important for us to both be aware of and to realize what the limitations might be. CredSniper is a framework to allow attacks against two-factor authentication. Uh, Google did a, a big, big survey a couple years ago on the uh, the victimization of two-factor authentication against Gmail. So this was millions and millions of sample sets. And what they found is that even with just SMS-based two-factor authentication, you were 99% less likely to be successfully compromised. 99%. Using more uh, complex files of two-factor authentication, like push notifications or U2FA, that number only went up. Two-factor authentication is not a silver bullet, but it's a really good one. We can't let outstanding solutions be the enemy of good enough solutions. Two-factor authentication is one we ought to look for whenever it's possible. 
But again, like when we discuss Kerberos, it's important to identify and understand the outliers. For example, this is some research that was conducted against the two-factor authentication system for G Suites for Business. We conducted this research while performing an assessment against a major uh, Fortune 500. So if you think, hey, yeah, everyone uses Outlook, nobody uses G Suite for Business. This is a Fortune 500 company that was using G Suite for Business. It is out there. It is quite common. It's very common in the mid-cap, uh, but even in Fortune 500 space, we still see G Suite for Business. It's absolutely there. So what is this? This here is in a captured exchange where the GFALR code returned by Google has to do with what the actual feature set is that's being triggered. In this case, this is an extension of MailSniper to include, or this research was performed while MailSniper was being extended to also support G Suite for Business, in addition to OWA, which it now does. When doing a password guessing attack, the automated system, right, the PowerShell script, needs to have some way of being able to identify if it was a good password or a bad password, if the user was real or if the user wasn't real. In this case, what we found is that the ALR codes varied here. ALR code of one for direct login, ALR code of um, five for redirect, we have those ALR codes here, or excuse me, five for a CAPTCHA, which Google will present after the fifth incorrect attempt. Um, and so what we found, though, were some outliers. We expected to see CAPTCHAs that would tell Mail Sniper that it needs to rotate um, its uh, proxy ser server so that it can bypass the CAPTCHA. Okay, pretty cool. Direct login, okay. In this case, they were using two-factor authentication, which means we shouldn't see any ones because it should respond with a login redirect, a 13. In this case, they were using Duo for their two-factor authentication. So Google would redirect to Duo for the 2FA, and then it would go back into Gmail. So we should have seen only 13s, 7s for incorrect users, or 5s for CAPTCHAs. We found a lot of other stuff there, too. And the most dangerous one was direct login. We found that a significant number of this Fortune 500's user accounts were not opted in to the two-factor authentication they had there. Two-factor authentication isn't a silver bullet, but it is a really good one. The problem is, what if you think you have it, but you don't actually have it in place? This is where vulnerability assessments and penetration tests step in in order to validate that our assessment of risk is accurate. So what about these offline password attacks? Offline password attacks are often really, really fun. If you're talking about password cracking here, you might be doing dictionary attacks or doing a brute force attack where we try every permutation of a password within a given key spat list, uh, space. Let's say all seven character passwords, lowercase, uppercase, with complexity. That'd be a brute force attack. When we audit domain passwords, we're going to look and see things like what you see here, where we have a large number of pass password hashes that we're able to acquire. Okay, we want to identify which ones of those are unique. That gives us information about the reuse of our password. We see here is a, is a uh, data set of 60,000 credentials where about 600 of these credentials have been reused. So that is a decent bit of password reuse, but for most enterprises, they would see a lot more than that, a lot, lot more than that. Um, it shows you how many were cracked. Here about half of the passwords were cracked. For a lot of enterprises, that's uh, better than average, I would say. Not, not by a lot, but a little bit better than average, uh, which is unfortunate, right? Half of your passwords being cracked successfully, that's better than average. We wanna do a lot better than that. But what's really important here is when we start to look at these groups, because again, not all users are created equal. An attacker can get access to a user via a successful phishing attempt. They can also gain access to that user via guessing their password correctly. But if the user already has a click via phishing, because they need to get into the environment, what additional value do they get by compromising more standard domain users? And the answer might be a lot because these standard domain users might be part of other groups that have access to certain systems or local systems in other places in the environment where an attacker can pivot and then use mimicats and leverage these trust relationships in Active Directory. But if we haven't plotted those relationships out, if we haven't identified the groups that are sensitive, we won't be able to determine which is a highly critical user such that when we crack it, we can put forth an effort to remediate that password and get that password changed to something more secure in a quick fashion. If we're talking about an enterprise of 60,000 people, there's no way you're going to get administrative approval to forcibly reset half of all employees' passwords. This is a really difficult hurdle to overcome. 
This means we need to think a little bit more laterally. If not all passwords are created use, uh, uh, equally, what's good enough for a domain user and what's good enough for a domain administrator? Good enough for a domain user might be, say, a 10-character password that's unique. A 10-character unique password, as we saw earlier, at 600 billion cracking guesses a second, still takes 17 days. Attackers aren't interested in investing 17 days of crack time against a standard domain user, but they absolutely are for a domain administrator. So how do we get these password hashes? I'm going to walk you through uh, a an, an, uh, brand new lab that's coming into 460 here in July where we actually do this. Uh, but our recommended mechanism to uh, pull down these hashes is with NTDS util. This is built into Windows systems. It's there by default, and it's a safe way to pull back the credentials from an Active Directory domain controller using image from media backups. That's what that IFM is. Um, a lot of penetration testers tend to go wrong here. They'll use some kind of tool like uh, Meterpreter in order to rip the credentials out of LSAS memory. That's the local security account subsystem service. This is really risky. The reason for that is NTDS.dit credentials on a domain controller, that's a lot of data. And that process is really important for the domain controller. Ripping things out of memory always carries with it a little bit of risk. So it tends to be better to use Microsoft tools the way they were designed to be used. This also points out an important thing to note with vulnerability assessment versus penetration testing. Not all penetration tests end up at domain admin. Which means not all penetration tests have the ability to perform a password audit. I've had a lot of penetration testers come to me and say, hey, you know, password cracking is really not part of vulnerability assessment. But the thing is, if a penetration test never gets domain admin, then they can't do a password audit. And if that's not something that a vulnerability assessment should do, then who does it? This is why this is such a big problem for our enterprises today. Because everyone says it's a hot potato and it's not ours. Or if it is ours, it's not something that we have to do. Password one is the number one vulnerability to enterprise environments today. I can't say that loudly enough. It's the number one vulnerability. This isn't a hot potato that we can pass around. If it's something we do 10 times, awesome. But it's still something we do. If your enterprise has never audited your passwords, you are sitting on a time bomb. The most recent incident response that uh, Open Security, my company, performed was for a, a legal firm. And they were compromised because they had exposed a remote desktop and the admin, and this was a, uh, a third party firm that does administration, right? That's all they do. It's an MSP, right? Managed Security Service Provider. Their service provider created a test account that was domain admin with a password. Unfortunately, it wasn't password one, it was password one, two, three. Not much better. They were compromised by an intrusion set and they were ransomed. This was a domain credential and a password audit. That, that account had been created years in the past. A password audit, even once yearly, would have prevented them from becoming compromised. This is the most important thing we can do for our enterprise security. Once we've pulled back the data, how do we actually extract the credentials we want to crack? We can use something by Impacket called secretstump.py. I'll demonstrate that here in the upcoming lab, or actually I'll demonstrate an alternative way to go around this. And then we use something to crack, something like Hashcat. Hashcat is the ability to use GPUs to enhance its password cracking and crack even faster, uh, which is outstanding. Uh, it supports all kinds of modes of cracking. Here we see mode 1000, which stands for NT hashes, the most common one we see in Windows Active Directory. This here is a cheat sheet for the use of Hashcat. As you can see, there's a lot to Hashcat. Uh, but Black Hills has a password cracking archive. And one of the things in the password cracking archive, you see in that link below. Uh, and they're just an outstanding resource on doing more and more password attacks and such. Then we want to actually audit these passwords that we've identified. And we can use a tool like DPAT by Kerry Roberts, who used to work for Black Hills, in fact. Uh, it's the domain password audit tool in order to give us a sheet like we see here. We see here is Passwords that were only cracked because the landman hash, which is very, very weak, was also stored. These shouldn't be stored in enterprises today. It's, it's a straight up vulnerability if they are. But that said, it's a feature of Windows, and we see them very commonly. Here we see that final account, August McGinnis Admin, is a domain administrator with a really, really strong 14 character long password, and it was successfully cracked. The only reason it was successfully cracked is because it had an LM, a really, really weak password hash stored. 
need to audit these things to find those vulnerabilities and purge them from our environments. So when we actually find these passwords, we discussed this very briefly already, what do we do um, in order to take action against these to remediate? Well, we want to identify things that should be patched and what shouldn't be, which means we have to have a password strategy for organization. What's well, good enough? Here's a tool called Cryptbreaker. Cryptbreaker takes advantage of AWS, so the cloud, in order to allow us to crack really, really quickly. This means that we can get away from using uh, individual password rigs um, that need to be updated on a regular basis. Uh, we don't have to build a $10,000 system in order to perform these cracks. In fact, when I'm doing a test, I will normally only crack up to $5 worth of password cracking resources. I find that that actually is really poignant for clients too, because I can say, hey, look, this is what we cracked in $5 or less. And if that includes domain admin passwords, that makes for a really strong proposition. And Cryptbreaker does this for us very, very easily, with just one command, in fact, when Docker's installed. Now, we do sometimes get or hear is, well, what about giving these passwords to a third party with AWS? Cryptbreaker never actually stores the user information and the hash in AWS. Only the hash goes there for cracking purposes. So you actually wouldn't know what password you've cracked, even if you were able to get that. But let's think about the threat model here for a moment, right? How would an attacker get access to this? They would have to be on Amazon. So they have to own Amazon, right? During the moment in which this EC2 instance is stood up, and before it's turned off, which is a short, short interval. If Amazon is pwned that badly, I don't think that our credentials are the biggest problem for the world. Because if Amazon is pwned that badly, that's the same thing as saying Microsoft is. Remember, Active Directory is connected to the cloud intrinsically today. If Microsoft is that compromised, our passwords don't matter. And the same is true, if you will, in many cases for Amazon. So the risk here, if we just look at it from a threat model perspective, is extremely, extremely low. But the efficiency that we gain and the speed in which we can do this is outstanding. So while, again, nothing's a silver bullet, if you haven't audited your passwords yet and you're debating around how to properly store this information, realize you're vulnerable to password one. Make no mistake. And so we want to absolutely be able to take advantage of these kind of things. Cryptbreaker will also automatically show some uh, graphs and analysis of the actual users and groups in your environment. For example, here we see password length frequency details. And in this password length frequency detail, we see that the most common password, eight characters. It's typical for enterprises. The second most common password length is five characters. Hmm. In most enterprises, the second most common password length we see is six characters, actually. And the reason for that is functional level 2003 domain controllers. And so what you sometimes see is passwords that are non-compliant with the actual password policy. That's what we're going to discover here in this quick demonstration. And so once we have Cryptbreaker, we can have it perform those cracks. We can export results to CSV. Uh, we can filter them. Are there even custom filters we can use in order to filter things by what is in a password policy or not in a password policy? We can set a password policy here directly and say evaluate versus that. Cryptbreaker does it all. Now, before the demo, one last thing to bring up. With Azure AD, right, so cloud-based Microsoft Active Directory protections, we have really new and outstanding features. This here is, um, I did a video on YouTube uh, in December, what my number one recommendation going into 2020 is for enterprises, and it's Azure AD password protection. You're already paying for it, it's already there, and it'll integrate straight to on-prem. What does this allow us to do? We can create custom password band lists. That means that you can create a list of passwords that you've successfully cracked, Add that to the list, and your users can no longer select that password. This is even aside from your password policy, right? You could have a weak password policy, but even in that weak password policy, they still can't choose password one because it's in your banned password list. This is the number one vulnerability in enterprises today, and Microsoft has given us an outstanding solution. Look into this and invest your time resources into it as well because you already own it. It's outstanding. Now, finally, let's take a look at some of this Active Directory auditing 
Alrighty. So we see here is a Windows domain controller. This is a 2008 R2 domain controller. Um, in 460, we have multiple. So you'd see on the left-hand side here that there's also a 2016 domain controller. Um, however, 2008 R2 is still the most common operating system that we see in enterprises today. So we want to have full exposure on that. Um, we can see here all those users. But first, we want to create that export list. It tends to be a good idea to change directory into uh, some place that's temporary. Let's say a, a temp folder here. And then we may want to actually pull back this data using that NTDS util command. In SEC 460, all of the labs are actually part of a wiki. And we chose this in order to make the, uh, the class as accessible as possible, as well as, to, um, as well as to take advantage of all kinds of multimedia uh, opportunities for the perspective of doing uh, our learning here, right? Because we want to make sure that your learning is optimized as much as possible. Uh, there we go. It's turned off. So what we see here is the, uh, the student virtual machine is being booted up right now. It's a Windows virtual machine. And when you log on to the virtual machine, it will automatically begin an update so that your lab instructions um, are up to date in perpetuity. This means that if students who have taken uh, SEC 460 in the past, this new lab will, once it releases, automatically show up on your wikis as well. So we want to make sure that you continue to have value from this course uh, in perpetuity. Um, now, of course, for the uh, the test, I always get this question too. There is a written workbook as well, so that written workbook will always give you a uh, um, a copy of the labs as they were when you actually took the class in person. And the USB flash drive that you have also has a version of the wiki uh, that is exactly as it was when you first took it. So best of, best of both worlds here. And here's our wiki. do have quite a few labs in the class because um, I find that learning while doing often tends to be the best way to go about many of these kinds of things. Because it's a wiki, we can also take advantage of things like moving pictures, GIFs, or GIFs if you must. This helps you to identify exactly not only what to do, but also what to expect as a response that comes back from this. Uh, in this case, let's take advantage of another feature. Copy and paste. Now, you might, of course, question, well, what's the value of that? Well, it turns out that oftentimes it's very easy to fat finger things, um, but that can be really, really frustrating, especially if you're learning in a class environment for eight hours a day over the course of an entire week. So we want to make that as, put, as easy as possible, too. Plus, frankly, uh, when I'm doing a password audit, I actually go straight through the 460 uh, lab instructions, despite having been the person who wrote those instructions. It's just a really easy way to make sure that you haven't missed anything and that you're not making any mistakes. Uh, in fact, if you look at things like operators in the National Security Agency, they very rarely actually type commands. They've pre-scripted these out and they're copying and pasting them into the terminal because it increases their precision. So if it's good enough for government work, why not? And so this NTDS util command, creates a folder with all of the files in it that we'll need for CryptBreaker. Now, if we navigate to that folder, we can zip this, send that to a compress zip folder. That now shows up here on our desktop, and then we can import this directly into CryptBreaker. This here is CryptBreaker. Uh, I've pre-baked this demo so we don't have to wait for passwords to uh, finish cracking. And what you can see here is passwords that were uploaded. You simply select Upload File. And then CryptBreaker will begin to import those. And we can then trigger a crack action. 
CurtBaker will actually also automatically reach out to Amazon in order to identify spot pricing so you can get the best price for your actual cracking job. Uh, generally speaking, we're talking something like 90 cents per uh, hour or so of use of these instances. Um, again, I generally don't crack beyond $5 worth of cracking. Um, and what we see here is that CurtBaker has given us some analytics on the hash that were successfully cracked and the actual passwords that were there. If we take a look at the report, Let's see if that virtual machine is still up. Oh, well, that's not going to work. It looks like my uh, VMware workstation just crashed. <laughs> oh, the demo gods. That does bring us to the end of time, though, so I'm going to demonstrate this via the uh, uh, the wiki, which I hope to still have up. Do I? No, I do not. Unfortunate. I can pull it up on the website, though. So CryptBreaker has its own website here. It's cryptbreaker.io with full instructions on how to use Cryptbreaker itself, as well as some demos of, uh, of how to use it too. Actually. And this here is that password policy audit I mentioned earlier. Within the ability to see the actual credentials and format them by those that are compliant or non-compliant with the organization's password policy. We can then export that as a CSV, which gives us a very quick ability to then say, hey, here's something for remediation, here's a vulnerability, passwords non-compliant with our own password policy. Have these users uh, passwords reset and changed. And that's really the power that we're looking to achieve with something like CryptBreaker and password auditing as well. All right, with that, uh, we are out of time. I'd like to open it up for a couple minutes for questions. Sure, thanks for that uh, great presentation, Matthew. Um, I'm gonna run through some of these questions that I've got here now. Um, you can still, everyone's still welcome to ask questions, by the way, just uh, pop them into the question box now. Um, first question uh, is, where can I get a copy of the vulner Vulnerability Assessment Framework? That's a really, really good question. Uh, we're working on that right now, actually. As part of the next release for 460, we're going to be putting out a lot of publicly available resources um, that aren't just based on the course, and that includes a full vulnerability assessment methodology. Um, a document that we want to publish, and we're going to put that on the SANS website. So the short answer, there isn't a way today outside of the class. Uh, long answer, give me a month and a half and we'll be there for you. Right, thank you. Um, what is the preferred offline password cracking tool? Uh, for offline password cracking, well, that's split into a couple parts, remember. So um, when we're talking about the cracker itself, that's Hashcat. So if you look at something like CryptBreaker, which we use for all of it, uh, CryptBreaker actually uses Hashcat on AWS. So when I'm personally doing cracking for enterprises, I almost always use CryptBreaker these days simply because it's so very easy. But if you'd like to go more manually in nature, Hashcat is absolutely my recommendation. Okay. Um, if you're going to do your own password cracking slash auditing, what kind of rig do you need? Um, so Black Hills has a really, really good um, blog post on this. So if you Google Black Hills and building your own password cracking rig, you'll see how they built this. This is actually the Black Hills password cracking rig. Uh, what's on the slide that you see now? Uh, this one is four NVIDIA GeForce 1080s, 1080 Ti's, um, SLI'd together. Uh, when it comes to the actual resources that you're using, the GPU is the most important thing. RAM its only importance is that you can load the operating system into RAM and that you can load your password dictionary into RAM. So you want to run that off of RAM, not actually off the hard disk. But if you're cracking 
slower than through your RAM, if you will. If your RAM's not your bottleneck, you don't need any more of it. So 16 gigs of RAM is kind of fine. Uh, your CPU generally doesn't have to be very strong for this at all. It's all that GPU, uh, which means your motherboard is going to need to be able to support that. Specifically, make sure your motherboard has the PCI Express lanes for all of the GPUs you're trying to put together for it. Uh, a rig like this will run you something like 5,000 bucks. Thank you. Um, someone just asking a question about LM hash. Uh, if your password is over 15 characters, does Windows not save the LM hash? That's a very, very good question. Uh, since we're in a, a, a shorter piece, uh, we abbreviate, or actually I cut that piece out of the section for the slides, <laughs> but it's an outstanding, outstanding question. So the reason we recommend 15 character passwords isn't because 15 characters is a magical number. It's because the way that Landman works, it actually says, hey, you know what's better than one password? Two passwords at half the complexity. I mean, it's a lot less than half. What it does is it splits your password into two seven character parts. So if you have a six character password, it pads out your six character password to seven characters, and then it creates a second character for you that is all padding, so it's basically blank, uh, which isn't strong, right? First password you guess, and that's that half is always just, is it blank? Yes, what do we know? It's A, less than seven characters, and B, it's an LM password. Uh, but if you always have to have two seven character passwords, what do you do when you have 15 characters? the algorithm doesn't work, it doesn't compute. And so the reason we recommend 15 characters is because if you have a 15 character password, it's impossible to have an LM hash. Very, very good question. Great, thank you. Um, next one, slightly uh, more straightforward question. Do you have a YouTube channel? And if so, what is it? I do, let me pull it up for you here. Um, And autoplay is just terrible. Alrighty, should see it on the screen now. It's just YouTube with my name at the end of it. Uh, nothing special or high tech. <laughs> um, I do regularly pr put out YouTube videos. So some, some of the ones you see here tend to be related to things like vulnerability assessment or uh, command and control, red teaming. Here's a, a review of uh, a vulnerability scanning tool called ScanFlan by Cloudflare. Uh, Azure AD password protection did a video on that. Uh, things like um, building back doors and stuff too. So information security related concepts and, uh, and topics. Um, one of the new series is that's going to be coming out soon is going to be a review of all of the major enterprise uh, vulnerability assessment style tools, things like uh, big VM, uh, data management systems like Brinka and Kenna, vulnerability scanners like Qualys and Nessus and uh, Acunetics and Nexpos. Um, so look forward to that content coming. Awesome, thank you. Um, so um, one more question here. Uh, we've got a, just a couple more to run through uh, and then we're done. Um, can we do all of these same operations that you've been talking about on different OSs, like the new patch of Windows 10 or Windows Server 2019? Um, well, let me break that into a couple pieces. Um, as far as the password auditing piece goes, um, if you're using something like CryptBreaker, it uses Docker, which is cross um, operating system compatible, so you could do that on, on Mac, you could do that on Windows, you could do it on, on Linux. I will say that if you're doing password cracking on Windows, Windows, the operating system itself, tends to like grab on, glom on to pieces of, of hardware, and you'll get a little bit less efficiency, so maybe like two, three percent. Uh, that said, I personally don't find that to be a big deal, so even if you're using Windows, it's not gonna be too bad. Um, vulnerability assessment itself, though, against an enterprise, I tend to almost always recommend Windows over anything else. Not because you don't need Linux, too. You, you do for some tools. Let's say uh, there's WordPress application, you want to do vulnerability assessment against it. WP scans written in Ruby and only runs on Linux. So sometimes you don't have a choice. But my take on this is for whatever security service you're doing, you want your system to be as compatible with the systems you're trying to access and assess as possible. And there's nothing more compatible with Microsoft Windows Active Directory than Windows and PowerShell. And so for, uh, say, something like vulnerability assessment, I do tend to recommend uh, Windows as a must um, and Linux as an, uh, you know, an addition whenever you have the need for it. Sure, thank you. Um, two more questions and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, how often does a password or should a password audit be performed on an enterprise? This is a really good question. Um, I think it actually depends. And it depends on how often your enterprise changes passwords. Now remember we also already kind of covered that not all users are created equal. So if your enterprise is doing the default every 90 days you need to change a password, 
the more you change your passwords, the more your users are going to select weaker and weaker and weaker passwords. It's just the way of the world. Um, so we want to require users to change their passwords less frequently, unless there's something like domain admins. We can create fine-grained password uh, uh, policies in Active Directory via a um, ADSI editor object. Um, in order to, to do this for special users, so like maybe create a special user password policy group for uh, domain admins where the lockout policy is one incorrect attempt and uh, the, the password strength is at least 20 characters or you know whatever you want to go, sky's the limit, including things like how often the password needs to be changed. But for your users, you want to actually lower that time so they don't change it as often because, I mean, think about it from the perspective of a brand new employee, right? You got, you're there for your first day, it's your first job, you're you know, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and you're happy. First password you pick is probably going to be a really good one. But you know that cynicism starts to build up with the company and your boss is mad at you because you couldn't log into your computer today because you forgot her password. You're really going to like make that password worse over time. So we want to preserve the life expectancy of those good passwords as much as possible. I tend to recommend for most enterprises that they change passwords for all users at least once a year, every, every 12 months or so, uh, to protect against things like credential stuffing, which is if you have passwords from breach data sets. Um, and I recommend that a password audit be performed at that same style of interval. So if you're changing user passwords every six months, because that's, that's the level of risk that your enterprise is willing to accept as far as passwords go, then you want to do a password audit every six months. If it's every year, do it every year. Right, thank you. Um, last question. Uh, how does SEC 460 compare to the Cyber Skills Roadmap? Um, I suppose my counter question is, what is the Cyber Skills Roadmap? I think it's the one from SANS that's built in, com uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a guess on what I think it is. So excuse me if I, if I went very wrong here. I, I think, think you're right. Yes. Yeah, so the one that stands made in, in cooperation with the DoD. It's actually kind of funny how 460 actually aligns with that. Um, so that one was made in like collaboration with what the DoD calls uh, like critical skill areas, something like that, KSAs. And so I was actually in the military at the time, on the military side, helping to build out what those requirements were going to be um, as part of the cyber protection team initiatives uh, for the US government. And so SANS was trying, of course, to build and model courses or figure out which courses they needed to have in order to align with those critical skills. And um, um, so when I left the military and I made 460, I actually made it to align with a ton of those. Uh, 460 in that case would be the only course that's actually made specifically to align with a lot of those. Awesome. Thank you very much. That, uh, that brings us to the end of our questions for today. Uh, so thank you once again so much, uh, Matthew, for your great presentation today. Uh, and thank you to all of our audience for listening in. Uh, the webcast slides will be available um, on the SANS registration page. Um, and until next time, take care, and we hope to see you again for the next SANS webcast.